Apocrypha is an adventure card game that I quite enjoy. Admittedly, its rules are dense, its manual borderline incomprehensible, its artwork highly inconsistent, but for some reason, I kept returning to it. I'm sorry, I did jump the intro a little bit there. Allow me a moment to gather my thoughts. I want chocolate. Yes, your memories are not deceiving you. I have reviewed Apocrypha before, and having a full year to play it, my thoughts have matured. My group has evolved to a reliable number, allowing regular sessions. The same group often pulled for other long-term games like Gloomhaven. And Apocrypha is the game most often desired to hit the table. It's not true. That's impossible. Let me be direct without distortion or concealment. We enjoy Apocrypha more than Gloomhaven. No! Look, I'll stand my ground. I love this game. No title is perfect, and I'll be listing my issues with it. But a year later, as I rally around the growing community of like-minded fans, I can declare in unison that Apocrypha is excellent. And I have returned to not only talk about why, but also simultaneously discussing its many expansions. As it stands, Lone Shark has promised several expansions throughout 2018. But as of this posting, they have yet to manifest in any physical sense. Yes, time has been kind. This is Chapter 2, The Flesh, and the finale, The Devil. Well, I have to assume the finale. I will say that I love the special touch of creating a single image across the boxes. Core Apocrypha includes nine missions, with the Book of Skinwalkers adding another nine. Incorporating the flesh... Ugh. Just saying flesh so often it's gonna get... icky. Like, moist. Moist flesh. Adds another four chapters of nine missions each. The Devil adds yet another four chapters and 36 episodes. In total, 90 missions can be found spread over all three boxes. Well, there are these Book of Hybrids, but let's leave those out for now. Before I dive into a holistic review Apocrypha, a quick recap. Okay, maybe a tad slower. Apocrypha takes much of its mechanics from the Pathfinder Adventure card game, despite the actual truth that it's the other way around. It's a very cool variant on a deck builder. Instead of purchasing cards on a flop, you encounter cards in your journey and then must overcome them using skills and dice. Either defeat the monster or add that gift to your hand. You must employ abilities both selfishly and cooperatively to recover spent cards as you don't automatically shuffle discarded cards. Imagine slamming Magic the Gathering into Legendary. At least Apocrypha won't retire my entire elf deck, Watsy, you sons of bitches. Moving on, you start with a customized bespoke arrangement of cards determined by your unique character. Said character is also listed with skills and scores in the various abilities. Mind, body, um... And I call myself an expert. Rage and soul. When you dive into a deck where your character is located, if you reveal a threat, you can fight or avoid it. If the former, you can roll against one of the two values using your matching skill, with this value equaling the number of dice to roll. You can use cards to add additional dice or even flip uh, values. The point is to beat this number and add the card to your hand. Another interesting mechanic is the clock, equating these omen cards. You must play an omen card to dive into a location deck, with each one, good or bad, potentially altering your potential success. With the right cards and teamwork, you should be able to recover used cards that you either discarded during a confrontation or lost via damage. The worst thing possible is to have a low roll against a threat because you can die very quickly if not careful. I know that seems easy on the surface, but the manual is not well constructed and the reference guide is dense. For example, I talked about recovering spent or lost cards, but didn't detail the six different ways that can happen. Or the fact that a turn has, in fact, six different steps further split into 12 different options during a turn. It doesn't help that the game often lists multiple terms for the same rule. Sanctifying and sealing and nexus, for example. Technically, sanctifying is a step, sealing's an action. The glossary is four pages. And I still haven't mentioned the fact that cooperation is limited to not only character locations on the board, but player positions around a table, and there are symbols denoting that as well. Uh. And I'm still not done. Each episode is marked by a unique mission and rules on how to list specific locations and how said locations can be encountered. It's understandable that so many people get overwhelmed with dealing with rules. Thankfully, 
considering it's a cooperative game, friends can help. Players can play cards based on orientation of the table to boost ally checks. They can also directly assist, adding in rerolls at the cost of mutation. Hopefully the cost will be worth it. Checks are easy. Roll as many dice as you can, take the highest three results, done. In my previous video, I compared Apocrypha rightfully with the adventure card game, but claimed Apocrypha was superior. Yes, Pathfinder does have more clearly defined character growth, and it benefits from the Pathfinder name as a setting. The latter isn't much to write home about. I like the creators of Pathfinder. I like what they have done with their rules. But their setting... And there are a few mechanical differences that point to the superiority of Apocrypha. Both games feature individual card decks for each player. Both use cards as, as a timer, whether they be blessings or omens. Admittedly, in Pathfinder, the blessings have a bit more functionality in that they can be discarded from a hand to improve you, yours or other player skill checks. But Pathfinder lacks the player placement cooperation, which adds rerolls, which I like better. Plus, there's a slight statistical issue regarding die usage. To put it simply, replacing a D4 plus 2 with a D12 plus 2 is not as useful as possessing a D6 and gaining another D6. In Pathfinder, you possess abilities that will allow you to upgrade dice from D4 to as much as a D12, but in Apocrypha, abilities are listed in dice, with boosting adding more dice. Apocrypha differs in that no matter how many dice you roll, you can only take the highest value of 3. I just find Apocrypha system easier to mitigate, and thus reducing the capacity for the random number generator to kill a game. I know, I'm repeating myself. Even the rulebook admits it is not a meticulous simulation of reality, and despite attempts to keep my disbelief willingly suspended, Apocrypha does break it from time to time. Thankfully, the setting is far more interesting than the vanilla fantasy of Pathfinder. In the core storybook, it lists the 10 regions of North America, unbeknownst to the reader that the Apocrypha Saga will encompass this entire map. Candle Point, the starting region, and Skinwalkers is included in the core book. The Flesh Gross. encompasses the Deathless, Fae, Golems, and Physicians, while the Devil finishes the story with Animus, Damned, Dreamers, and Serpents. And according to all sources, this concludes Apocrypha as we know it. Through these stories, you will deal with the denizens and thralls of the Nine Listed Gods, or Supreme Beings. Supreme being. If only I was that lucky. Abramelin, Aleph, Kairos, the Morrigan. They're names. They're just names. It's a modern or urban horror tale, one of the most unique settings employed by a board game, despite the genre being beaten like a dead horse in television and movies. You know, like the Dresden Files and Twin Peaks. Millennium October Faction, Heartless Dark Shadows. I know, I'm repeating myself. Diving a bit deeper, where Pathfinder dealt with traditional medieval weapons and spells, Apocrypha took a more surreal approach to combat. Instead of a sword, you might have sparks. Or a stuffed bear. It's a stuffed bear! I, I mean, some appear more traditional, a sword cane, snakeskin boots, but what the heck is a Mondrian cell? Or indexing? Some of the cards are quite abstract, and there's a murder board, which is not. <laughs> As none of them detail exactly what they do, it's left up to the imagination. Like a vice dog implies you've picked up a pet, a bruiser implies you possess some muscle to back you up. But how do the cookies work? I started to think some of these magic items are simply in your possession and gift your character with abilities by simply owning them. Like their paranormal artifacts best locked up in a SCP Foundation vault. And then there's tech support. The poppet. A lantern clown. Lantern clown? Lantern clown? And then I realized these gifts are not artifacts or friends or spells. They're all of them. And it's up to each card to define what it represents. Except the lantern clown because that's creepy. And apparently it's also the only one. Like there's three of every gift in the game except for that one creepy clown card. Yeah, no thank you. The Canterpoint missions can be played in any order with each mission representing some holiday. And I love how each mission can feel totally different. Sometimes you have many locations, then you can have only one. Each mission does feel unique. The only issue was that lack of continuity. Outside of the memory fragments you gain upon each successful mission, cards you seed around your halo and can sacrifice for a one-time boon. I won't go into specific missions in order not to ruin the stories, but I will discuss the expansions in a broad sense and how they add new mechanics to an already complex game. The first sequel, The Included Skinwalkers, adds more mutations, more omens, and a variety of new and unusual gifts and threats. It also adds rules regarding lycanthropy 
and lunacy. With the former, you actually suffer deaths into your deck, and when you draw them, they get placed in your halo face down. They don't actually count as deaths. The number of slotted cards become your lunacy number, which you write down on the divider. At the beginning of a new Skinwalkers game, you reset this arrangement, but shuffle that number of deaths back into your draw deck. These count against your hand when drawn, and as said, once revealed, are slotted in your halo, potentially covering up useful abilities. You might think this makes Skinwalker missions more difficult, but several cards, like the Dog Collar, allows you to sacrifice these cards to flip die results. Moonshine allows you to add your lunacy value to your roll, and there are others. The interesting twist are the Enduring Fragments. No longer fleeting, these are permanent new abilities your character can possess, and some of them are quite cool. However, one issue begins to arise. It's called stashing. Once a player possesses enough Enduring Fragments, and when playing an Omen of Hope, said card is stashed after it is used, meaning it's removed completely out of the game and all future games. So despite becoming better, the darkness of the world is beginning to counter. Thankfully with Skinwalkers, like all further chapters, you can unstash specific omens upon completing missions. Brace yourselves, I'm going deep. Which brings us to the flesh. Ew. This new expansion also offers new characters to play, like a hacker, a wild child, a roughneck, and a mentally unbalanced patient. One of these things is not like the other. The first book of Deathless takes us into the foreboding wastelands of Canada. If you thought the core book's cards were creepy, these are borderline terrifying. More enduring fragments, more mutations, more gifts, though some appear to be repeats. Except they're not. Repeated entries and illustrations may often possess altered results based on the new chapter's theme. A new mechanic involves slotting cards you encounter as death cards in your halo, potentially resulting in your permanent death, but potentially offering you more abilities. This is a neat idea, if more than two cards possessed it. Another neat mechanic is Grave Bound, which go into effect while they are face up on your discard pile, a neat mechanic indicated by the red blotches on the card, which is something I had to figure out as the game doesn't tell you this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help. You can now slot a death card immediately upon fading to reset your entire deck and resume playing. But the cool thing is the well. Seven of the nine missions can be played in any order, but you must complete all of them to reach the way down low and the climactic welcome oblivion. Several missions will add cards to the well indicated by this divider. These can be threats, gifts, deaths, or fragments. Through the missions, this stash of cards can get quite high, and yes, all of these cards you will have to deal with at some point. The Book of Fate takes you into the idyllic enchanted lands of... Nebraska. No, seriously, the entire northern central region of the United States is apparently under the domain of elves and fantasy creatures. I kid you not. More interesting and weird enduring fragments, including one where you have to bite off corners of the card, new rules are introduced involving the rolling of doubles or triples, and I can't believe this is a thing, unique mechanics based on reflexes. I wish this wasn't a thing. But in some situations, you have to toss a card, catch dice, in order to activate certain effects. And if you played Space Movers with me, you can see how this is going to go. Crap. Darn. Seriously? Son of a- Like Deathless, the Book of Fae involves a fixed ending with the mission season close, though with this campaign, you only need to finish three specific missions to proceed. Book of Golems moves us to California and involves the mythological creatures and their modern examples. You know, robots. While there are some new and interesting additions with Golems involving keywords and the like, the big addition is the Rampage system. Each time you succeed or fail on a body or rage check against a Golem threat, you gain either a plus one or minus one. At the end of the mission, if above zero, check plus one. If below, minus one. Culminate these values and then adjust the threat values of future threats you encounter, meaning the more you win, the more difficult the golems get. Although there is no climactic mission, you are expected to complete the three theme mission groups, clones, drones, and zones, together, thanks to this nifty graph. Finally, we reach the physicians, traveling completely across the country to Florida, and this is 
just awful. The cards, not Florida. I'm sure Florida is a nice place. Physicians, well, they're kind of mean. Place one random mutation card next to each nexus. Additional dice may be added when encountering a minion or true threat, but you can trash that die by adding in symptoms, which may also be revealed thanks to other events. As you play the game, more may end up being revealed and all visible or in effect. The first eight missions can be completed in any order, leading to the final mission, Encyclopedia Apocalyptica. On to the devil. The devils! <laughs> One new hitch is that of Awakened Enduring Fragments and the Awakened King, which don't get unlocked until you finish the Sleeper Wakes mission. Once you do, you gain new fleeting fragments based on the completion of previous chapters. Other new characters include a paleoherpetologist. Paleo huh, that's actually a thing. A gator wrestler, a circus attraction, and a non-Euclidean geometer. That is not a thing. Animus takes us to Alabama, and I can't wait to see what we got there. Um, okay. Animus introduces Allegiance, with a choir, which is the group of players, must decide to either appease or oppose Mother Gaia. Mark that decision on the divider. Each option alters how a mission is played. If you select appease, the game gets a bit harder. Defeated threats are slotted on either side of your allegiance divider based on your decision. Then complete the first seven missions accordingly. Certain cards will alter depending on your allegiance. Eventually, the story will culminate in either the Battle of New Orleans or the Bargaining Table. I like this structure, offering for probably the first time a sense of actual continuity, albeit a light one. The Damned certainly looks unusual, and it possesses some of the wildest new mechanics thus far. The story takes you to the gambling capitals of America, so you may notice a particular theme with the new rules. Subtlety is not a virtue with these guys. The Enduring Fragments are now listed as contracts with the various gods in the setting. You can now stick a card, display one like you would display a weapon in the Pathfinder card game, add a bonus die. If you win, recycle the card. If you fail, you must sacrifice it. That is a cool mechanic. To further the theme, the chapter also adds gambling. After rolling for a check, you may decide to re-roll a certain number of undesirable dice trashing odd results. Another cool mechanic. Notice the old core box card, Bones, now offers a totally different mechanic. Vice targets alter their dice goals based on the player's ability, so if you have a soul of 2, this mind check increases to 17. Finally, there are contracts. These are slotted in your halo for that mission upon victory, offering you an additional boon at a cost. Most of these are threats, meaning when you defeat them, they become your thrall effectively for that mission. This can prove incredibly useful when dealing with some of the more difficult opponents in this chapter. For the campaign, you can complete missions in any order, but each player must possess one of the new Enduring Fragment contracts before attempting the final mission, the Lighthouse. Missions also possess random Nexus locations and random true threats. Roll two dice, each value applying to a different table. The total of the roll can also alter the ratio of Doom and Hope Omens in the clock. That's a new one. The Dreamers takes us to New York and Maine, where all romantics live. It introduces this complicated structure and time travel. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. It's not so dramatic. Locations now have discard piles. When a card is sacrificed, it's instead discarded beside it. When you use a time travel power, you can reload cards in order to back up the deck. Dream sharing allows you to examine a card and replace it with a Dreamer's card of the same type. Neat. Dice targets are also introduced, meaning you roll the number of dice to set the goal rather than having it be fixed. The prize it took them that long to try that out. The Dreamer chapter also introduces that Awakened King character. Missions are... Okay, this time I have to admit the meta is taken a bit far with this one. I kid you not, you must complete a mission in real life, aka Awakened, in order to unlock any dream mission. Players must then complete a dream mission in that same play session before any players go to sleep. And I swear to God, this is the format of the chapter. When all four dream missions are complete, you can tackle the final, The Sleeper Awakes. Finally, we get to the Book of Serpents and the deserts of Texas and New Mexico. And there isn't actually as many crazy rules in this section compared to the others. This one is interesting. There are three dividers to work with, including the Ziggurat. Oh, this one is clever. 
To build the pyramid after rolling, you can place dice to create the base 3x3. Three three. The second row must possess dice of a higher value, and finally the top row must be uh, a die higher than the lower rows. When you assemble dice, you can remove any number of matching dice from the ziggurat, as well as dice being supported by it. This is a nutty mechanic when you consider there are 14 dice required to build the ziggy, and only 20 dice included in the game. The ziggy Ziggy comes into play against these ordeals. There are also additional rules including the slither, where a thread is shuffled into a random nexus, and the fact that all true threats employ mutations. As for the chapter structure, like the Ziggy, it involves four foundation missions, four staircase missions, and one finale. She who would wake the dragon. You must win two adjacent lore missions in order to complete a higher one, and so on until reaching the climax. It all comes down to this one, and yes, there is a level of finality to this. I won't say much, but the episode does mention a potential pending apocalypse, so no pressure. <sighs> Finished. Actually, not yet. Being quite the study of these rules, I made some observations regarding the mechanics. For one, I understand why the opening fleeting fragments are employed, but it does imply a false sense of assumption on how future games are played. You have to rebuild your deck to the same composition of type cards at the end of each mission. Although you can alter what those cards are from your collection, you always start a mission virtually the same. And when you use a fleeting fragment, it is gone forever. This mechanic is entirely abandoned the moment you leave this introductory area, and all fragments become enduring, meaning they permanently boost your character in organic ways Pathfinder could only hope to achieve. With that game, you know perfectly well how your character can advance. It's a character defined by a race and class. In Apocrypha, there is no definition, and your development is based entirely on choices made, and I find that so much better. I mean, slotting in permanent death cards is annoying, as there are few ways to remove them, but the game does introduce so many new characters that you are unlikely to ever run out. But are there elements of Apocrypha I would change? Well, yes. But these are minor quality of life improvements that I believe make the game fairer. Easier. It makes the game easier. Outside of the damn missions, you create a clock from random doom and hope omens. I would generally intermix equal hope and doom cards, then shuffle. I just think that's fair. And fully admitting this does alter a game in the favor of players, I have no problem adding in only hope omens in the player decks. I mean, it's their personal decks. Why not have them be hopeful? Although we don't employ this rule, if you are still looking for an easier game, I would suggest adding in two skills per check instead of one. Thank God, I forgot about the Book of Hybrid. Look, I am a bit of a completionist. I have the promo cards and this booster pack called the Book of Hybrids. As stated, when you introduce a new chapter, you add all the cards to the core set. But when you shift to a new chapter, you take those cards out. And when you sacrifice cards from that chapter, they don't go back into the box, meaning you lost them forever. This is to prevent the decks from getting too big, though it does involve a, a tad bit of annoying busy work when you change chapters. The Book of Hybrids challenges you to mix two chapters together. I wouldn't bother then to use the, the core cards at all, as you'll probably have enough from the two chapters to work. The pack states this is an 11th chapter, but there doesn't appear to ha have any continuity in relation to the previous episodes. There are nine more episodes in this pack, each involving a different combination of previous chapters. It's a nice trick, but you do have to separate all the cards after each mission, which can and will get annoying. And I would only tackle these if you completed the entirety of Apocrypha and still want more. And God bless if you do, because 90 missions is longer than Gloomhaven's campaign. And what a ride this game is. From the differing rules to the broad variety of characters, Apocrypha is a fascinating journey down a very dark rabbit hole. I adore the mood, the unpredictable mission structures, and the fulfilling experience. Yes, I did knock my initial review down thanks to its clumsy manual, but having now grasped and surmounted the obstacles, what remains is one of, the, one of my all-time favorite games. I award Apocrypha a 9 out of 10. One of the most... <laughs> yeah, right. What? The manual still sucks, the randomization can be a killer on occasion, permadeath is still a thing I'll never agree with, and come on, needing to play twice before going to sleep... Moving players around a table, we could have done without those. <clears throat> anyway, one of the most underappreciated games of recent memory. This is Chris from DSX Machina.